full impact um, speaker and her slides today. And we will all mute ourselves, put our questions in the chat box. And, and Wendy and I and Carolyn will take a look at the chat and see if we can help Joanne move through, through her presentation. There you go, Wendy, any other comments? Nope, and I, I, I know I clicked the record button. You did. Good, that so was good. we're good yep. to go. We're, we're rolling, wonderful. All right, well, I'll, I'll just by very brief uh, way of introducing myself and how I came to be uh, doing this chat with you and welcome to everyone and thank you for taking time on a beautiful day to, to join us. Uh, I trained in 1995 as uh, a master gardener when I bought a house in North Arlington and there were some uh, dogwoods that were in trouble and I didn't know what I was doing. Anyway, I ran into people who said, oh, you should take the master gardener class. And I signed up for it. And the, the plants that we were trained in, in 1995, by you know the worthies at the National Arboretum and all the wonderful federal agencies and other you know, terrific resources that we happen to enjoy in this area, were plants that were disease resistant, right? And pest resistant. And um, when you think about what pest resistant means, we're gonna be talking about that today uh, because the list of plants that we were all about, uh, again, when I, when I received my training, uh, were uh, plants that, that nobody ate. And uh, because who likes seeing holes in leaves? All right, and it, it turns out that the plants nobody eats uh, have become a problem that's only been recognized in the past, um, well, in the past, let's say 20 years, uh, there's been growing recognition of what that has meant about the way we've handled our landscapes. So fast forward, uh, I worked for five years with Cooperative Extension. I was the county's horticultural technician. I managed community gardens. I trained master gardeners. I continue as a, an active master gardener with their continuing education process. But when I, uh, when I left that job, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I also uh, trained as a master naturalist because I was more interested in that kind of thing. And I think there's at least one other master naturalist I saw uh, Barbara Raisin on this call. Um, and I began working with the Audubon Society of Northern Virginia because I was interested in knowing more about birds. And that's uh, led me to an interesting journey uh, at the time, federal monies became available to uh, the state of Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and it were, they were administered uh, from NOAA uh, to the Coastal Zone Management Agency to do a social marketing campaign to teach people about native plants and encourage their use. So notice that there was a water quality value here and imperative. Uh, that was being exercised. And the campaign, uh, the social marketing campaign to bring to the public, as well as to wholesale suppliers and retailers, the need to uh, market the plants that were originally native in our areas that we had replaced with all these pest resistant plants. And so, uh, the first campaign was on the Eastern shore, then there was one on the native neck, and then it came to Northern Virginia. I now am co-chair, <clears throat> excuse me, of this campaign uh, called Plant Nova Natives, Northern Virginia Natives. And the campaign has gone on. It has uh, generated similar campaigns in virtually every part of Virginia. The ones in Southwest Virginia and the Shenandoah are still sort of in their infancy and we're supporting them. But there is in fact um, a Plant Virginia Natives Now um, web page from which if you have friends in other parts of the state, uh, you, can, you can help them uh, get connected. And what I thought I would do was spend maybe 15 or 20 minutes uh, explaining what that's about with you. I've got a little uh, PowerPoint to, to dash through. Uh, and then uh, and then get to the questions that you have. Uh, I was invited to talk about the Plant Nova Trees campaign, which we launched last year uh, as part of the Plant Nova Natives uh, campaign. Uh, and we, we did this in response to a mandate 
to get 600,000 native trees planted in the Northern Virginia area. And again, part of this is about water quality and carbon capture and trying to replace what I'm sure most of us understand as a disappearing canopy um, for any number of reasons. So if that sounds reasonable, continue to add questions into the chat as they come and I'll try to pause, but um, <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen and pull up a PowerPoint that will just run through that looks more broadly at why native plants are getting the attention that they are and why we need to kind of think differently about how we're managing uh, the landscapes that we have. So uh, I've just mentioned um, this, this campaign and uh, we, we won't, I, I'm gonna dance through a lot of this uh, so that we have more time for conversation because this is coffee and conversation, not just uh, an education. But originally before, you know, before we came, this is what the Eastern forest would have looked like, right? And this is what we have now. Okay, um, uh, a, a landscape that we've taken over and the parts that weren't forest were, were meadows and, and full of the kinds of plants that this is what we have now, effectively from the perspective of critters, wildlife, uh, this is a food desert, all right? And what we have in our landscapes, and believe me, this is what, I have had in my own garden are plants that come from all over the world, right? So uh, this is our burning bush, which is beautiful in the fall, right? Uh, a euonymus that comes from Asia. Asia happens to have uh, climatic conditions that are very similar. Uh, hot, humid summers, cold winters, have to, these plants have to manage it. Uh, again, the calorie pear uh, that <clears throat> was the basis for our Bradford pear, a hybrid that we can talk about a little bit if we get there, because uh, somebody asked about invasive plants, and this is one of the worst, um, uh, again, originates in Asia. Uh, we have a lot of evergreen plants here that come out of uh, other parts of America, right? But the problem is that <clears throat> from uh, an ecological perspective, stuff that most of us in our generation were not trained in, weren't thinking about, um, those pest resistant plants are resistant because every plant has defenses against being eaten, right? You, you know, they don't wanna be consumed uh, by insects. They wanna, you know, they wanna survive and uh, but it, it turns out that certain insects uh, are able to uh, absorb and manage those poisons that are intrinsic to the plant. They develop the kinds of enzymes in their digestive tract that allow them uh, to manage that. And it turns out that many insects over millennia become specialized in the particular plant or genera or family of plants <clears throat> that they uh, have evolved with, that they co-evolved together. And uh, the poster child for this is the milkweed. A lot of us know about the monarch, right? Monarch has to have a milkweed. Um, it, it's, a, it's a plant with this very toxic alkaloid. Uh, if you break off a leaf, you'll see this white sap exuding. Um, but the caterpillar, the larvae, of the, um, the monarch butterfly has managed that particular in, um, alkaloid. And uh, as a result, you know, it, it has done well because it absorbs that poison. Other things find it distasteful. So um, the other problem that we have <clears throat> is that we've introduced plants uh, many, many times for good reasons. I'm showing you a picture here of kudzu that's covered uh, our woodlands 
and a Japanese polygonum that people thought was attractive. The kudzu was actually brought in to control erosion at the Dust Bowl period. Um, and so uh, other plants that are considered invasive now, once they've been loose on the landscape long enough, uh, are, are uh, plants that were brought in uh, because they provided berries that would be good for game hunting. So uh, we've brought these things in and um, without understanding what they would do. I talked about the Bradford pear. It was in theory bred to be a sterile plant. So there was thought that nothing uh, would come of it in the landscape, but it turns out that pollination is a complex process and cross-pollination happens. And the, uh, the result are a proliferation of this plant in the rose family, um, <clears throat> which is really quite beautiful in the fall, right? It's got these beautiful red leaves. It's quite beautiful in the spring, but this is what's happened uh, as it's been let loose in the landscape. And uh, the Bradford pear now, you probably saw it two weeks ago if you were out uh, driving down I-95 or any other major highway um, where, where it has planted itself. I spent a lot of time out at Occoquan National Wildlife Refuge doing natural history field surveys of, of uh, wildlife out there. And it's, it's, it's taken over that, that um, space, which was you know, designed to be um, a special reserve for wildlife. Uh, well, here's the unfortunate thing uh, about a Bradford pear. It, it is not co-evolved and it supports very little insect life. And it turns out that insect life is the basis for all other life on earth. So here are a few more examples of uh, plants that have been brought in, the tree of heaven from Asia, mimosa, also an Asian tropical plant. They do well here. Paulonia is uh, revered in Korea and <clears throat> I believe Japan. I'm sorry, it's missing an A there. Autumn olive is one of the plants brought in uh, because it would feel that feed those game birds. And uh, so, you know, all of these well-intentioned uh, and, and often very beautiful plants. The one on the lower left is the Nandina uh, that it is evergreen and has those beautiful berries. So, um, you know, and here's the, here's the burning bush. All right, so you know, here's here's our monarch, and this is the this is here to tell us the story about the coevolution of invertebrates, and, on which all vertebrate life depends. Um, in in thinking about the the trophic levels, the um, insects feed the birds; they feed all the other reptilian uh, critters in our landscape, and uh, without our insect. Um, without our insect <clears throat> healthy population, we are in trouble in the landscape. So it's um, the monarch is our poster child, but the untold story are the many, many species uh, that are plant specialists. And the problem is that we have in changing the way we landscaped in papering over, if you will, uh, our suburban areas with lawns, um, we have removed the material of life. And uh, <clears throat> you may or may not recall about four years ago, just before COVID, there was a good bit of publicity about uh, the loss of 60% of our bird population. And, um, and one of the reasons that has been tracked is the loss of the caterpillars that birds, this is a, an Eastern bluebird, uh, very, very colorful, very attractive uh, representative of our bird species. And uh, all birds <clears throat> depend upon a supply of adequate protein in order to simply reproduce successfully, all right? And uh, so this chickadee, uh, how many of you have seen chickadees in your uh, in your setting, in your gardens, in your backyards? Fairly common uh, backyard uh, Northern Virginia um, bird, uh, small size, and you can see what this bird is um, is collecting here. 
it turns out, I'm just gonna go back to that image for a second. It turns out that for this small bird to raise a successful nest of let's say three or four eggs, they will have to have between six and 9,000 caterpillars over the course of two and a half weeks, right? Now, um, the, the person who has been uh, responsible for bringing a lot of this to our attention and doing a lot of public education and whose book was the basis of a lot of our, <clears throat> um, a lot of our uh, coming of age in this uh, educational process is an entomologist, uh, an insect specialist, a, science, a scientist of uh, birds, of, of insects named Doug Tallamy, a professor at the University of Delaware. And Dr. Tallamy uh, bought a piece of property with about 20 acres outside the University of Delaware. And he did what uh, an insect scientist does. He walked into his front yard. There was a Bradford pear on the one hand and a native white oak on the other. And he took a census of what was eating them, right? And on the white oak, he found 19 different species and 150 different caterpillars. And on the Bradford pear, he found two, right? And they were, they were generalist little inchworms. And this was such a, a stark revelation of the problems that, again, we have created in the way we've managed our landscape for eye candy, right? And a Bradford pear is definitely eye candy. It's showy in every way possible. Uh, and that really began his commitment to taking this message to the rest of us. So Dr. Uh, Tallamy uh, has the benefit as an academic of grad students and um, access to uh, a, a lot of data. And he began to look at the, the um, relationship between our, our native trees and our, our other native flora and insect life. And one of the things that he's documented are uh, those particular species that, if you will, can be considered keystone species in our environment because they support so many different species of particularly Lepidoptera, meaning moths and caterpillars, moths and butterflies. Um, and look at what tops the list, our native oaks. This number has actually gone up. It's now 560s um, because you know we're learning more about this all the time. Uh, and <clears throat> there was one question in the chat box already about weeping willows. Unfortunately, weeping willows are not among our native willows. And yet the willow species can be among the most productive in our landscapes in terms of supporting a large number of uh, invertebrates. And notice cherries there. Again, we're talking here about our native cherries, particularly the black cherry, but we're not looking here at those iconic Japanese cherries that are planted around the tidal basin and in my neighborhood, there was one in every front yard. So um, this, this just gives you some idea about what we're talking about. And I, I don't want, in talking about the birds, I don't wanna leave out you know, reptiles and amphibians, all of them depend upon this tropic level. And um, this is the, a graph of what's going on locally in our Northern Virginia area with our, our bird populations. And the decline really has to do with losing habitat. Um, as, as this particular slide shows, there's also a role being played by our tall office buildings where window collisions, and even in my particular suburban habitat, we've picked up four carcasses where birds have collided with windows. We can talk about what you do about that. <clears throat> but uh, a lot of it has to do with simply the, the decline of our, our habitat that's available uh, for these species. So, you know, there's not a lot we can do about all the 
hardscaping in our area, but um, what we can control and more than 60% of the land east of the Mississippi is in private hands. 95%, I think it is, of the land in Texas is owned privately. So we can do something about this. And uh, Dr. Tallamy has started uh, and actually written a book called Nature's Best Hope. And Nature's Best Hope, he says, is us. That this is something we can actually change uh, by creating sanctuaries in our gardens. And the way we do that is to repopulate them now with the plants that were here before we came along and that belong in the landscape and support these um, insect species. And so that's what I've been really dedicating my volunteer hours to uh, by and large is this kind of public education event that we're doing today and working with our local parks and our, our different organizations to support their, uh, their efforts. Uh, this is probably one of the, the, the happiest um, sorts of plants to come across when it's in bloom, right? Our Japanese honeysuckle. Sadly, this happens to be probably the single greatest pest in our southeastern forest ecosystems because the birds, after, after we enjoy the flowers and their beautiful perfume and their sweet nectar, uh, when they go into uh, fruit, the birds take the fruits, they poop them out somewhere in the woods, and pretty soon you have honeysuckle coming up. Unfortunately, honeysuckle grows up trees and will eventually, a young tree, it will actually uh, choke that tree. So one of the things we can do is reduce that food desert lawn that we have by planting it out. And this is a, a neighbor of mine who's crazy about butterflies and grew up on a farm uh, in the Northern Neck. And he has uh, taken his property. And in addition to fruit trees uh, and some edibles, you know, he's added things that are going to feed uh, the insect larvae. And of course, another thing we can do is to be very responsible about our pesticide use. Um, and so gardening in, in other ways and managing the water on our property uh, is, is yet another thing. And uh, just if, for those of you who are still at home, one of the best things you can do for birds, I'm gonna uh, mention this right now, especially in the winter is to offer uh, water for them. Uh, that's that's a, a really useful thing. And somebody asked about deer uh, in the chat. And this is another public education program that <clears throat> I think the Master Naturalist would probably be happy to bring. Uh, I could give you a whole program just on the problem that we have with white-tailed deer, uh, who, again, We've lost the, the predator layer for deer. The only predator that remains is the human predator in our Eastern areas and their populations as a result have simply uh, mushroomed out of control. And so um, the only way to regenerate and maintain uh, our urban forests is to encage our young trees because remember about that re relationship <clears throat> between our wildlife and our native uh, plant products, the plants that the deer prefer are our native plants by and large. That's not to say they won't go after things, but if you think about the hostas that they're eating in your garden, if you have deer and hostas, uh, you know, those are, those are Asian plants, but by and large, in our forests and in our woodlands, they're eating down the next generation of plants that would ordinarily come up and replace uh, our dying, um, uh, the, the present dying generation. So some of the things that we can do um, is, is quit removing all our leaf litter at the end of the year we can find out about native plants. And this is the chief product in the social marketing campaign that I told you about, Plant Nova Natives. And it's a guide to native plants. It's for sale um, at, uh, at, at some establishment vendors like uh, For the Wild Birds carries this book. 
Uh, Maryfield has carried it in the past. I hope they have it now. Um, it's available at all uh, native plant sales. You can also order it online or get a PDF version and just refer to it on the web. <clears throat> and as part of uh, trying to make this easier on people, our wonderful outreach person in this campaign, Margaret Fisher, <clears throat> has created a plant app that you can put on your phone. And if you're going shopping and you're wondering, is this plant native or is this plant not native? Uh, so uh, we're trying to make it easy. We also have uh, established a cooperative relationship with our local nurseries that, who allow us to come in and mark the plants that are native because they've begun to recognize that this is a market uh, that's viable for them. And so happily, we have been able to work with them. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna kind of jump through some of the different landscape projects uh, that, that this slideshow highlights, but notice that the very first one uh, that is mentioned here is to plant a shade tree. So I'm gonna go back to Dr. Tallamy and <clears throat> the work he and his uh, department and graduate students have done. They took a look at what it would take to raise chickadees successfully in suburban backyards, such as I have, and possibly some of you have. Uh, they did studies in Cherrydale in Arlington and over in uh, Tacoma Park Silver Spring area. And they studied the, the um, foliage, the amount of foliage and what percentage of that was native and what percentage of that was introduced. And then they looked at uh, the presence of chickadees and their success in raising uh, and their fledglings, um, their young. And they were able to determine that a chickadee would do fine with a level of foliage cover, a native level of foliage cover that's 70%. All right, so getting back, if you can remember the image I showed you with you know, this plant's from Asia, this plant's from Africa, you know. Um, a lot of us have gardens that are full of acuba uh, and rhododendrons and a uh, burning bush and things of that sort. And if we have a native oak tree, remember that keystone species that supports over 560 species uh, of Lepidoptera, a major portion of the foliage, right, in our garden is going to be native. If we have an introduced Zelkova or Mimosa or Tree of Heaven, uh, you've greatly reduced the percentage of your, your native foliage. And so that's why the first and foremost thing you can do to try and restore habitat value in your gardening is to plant a native shade tree or to plant several, right? And usually uh, what's at war with this is our common aesthetic that a lawn is what suburbia means, having a beautiful swarth where it's open and you've got open sight lines. So part of what we need to think about is a changed, aesthetic. And that's, that's sort of my theory. Our eyes are educated with a certain palette of plants. We expect to see them when we go looking for a new home to invest in, or when we work with our homeowners association on the landscaping, or, you know, our, our condo association. But we can also begin to make changes in our understory. And the understory is every bit as important as our canopy. So we can also change out or as things die, replace uh, with small flowering shrubs like this native rhododendron and the beautiful service berry. And we can turn to native ground covers instead of liriope. We can put in the carex or sedge that is found in our natural areas here. We can swap out a columbine or aquilegia that you see on the left. 
there we go, for our beautiful native, which is blooming right now, and which is a source of nectar for the early arriving hummingbirds and <clears throat> plant pollinator gardens about. So these are images of, uh, you know, some people have a notion that a, a, a native plant garden has to be a messy thing, not so. Uh, conservation landscaping can be designed to capture stormwater through rain gardens. Here's a rain garden uh, that has been installed. Uh, a meadow isn't something we're gonna be doing in Arlington, but here we get to uh, our native tree um, campaign that we're working on. Uh, the, one of the questions came up in the, in the chat box um, and about why 600,000? And I am a little bit fuzzy about whether this was through the Chesapeake Bay Ordinance um, conventions that that particular number was governed by. We work with the Department of Forestry uh, as a member of our, our Plant Nova Natives, Plant Nova Trees campaign. And so um, the, the person that we work with there um, you know, said, I've been tasked with doing this and uh, uh, so we're, we're just trying to help out. And one thing that you all can do if you have neighbors and friends who've been planting trees is to encourage them to um, report that because it helps add to the data. All right, well, I think that this might be, let me just uh, briefly see where this goes. All right, so why trees? Um, the difference, in a, a, your, your uh, car's temperature in the summer, right? We all know about the advantage of the shade tree. It can be over 25 degrees. And here are you know, some of the reasons why, um, why trees, well, why, why are we losing so many trees? I just got an email on one of my listservs <clears throat> about people who back up to Donaldson Run and who have been taking trees down for their for the purpose of improving their lawns, uh, and they back up into a, the natural area. So, uh, one of the projects that the Plant Nova Trees Initiative has engendered is the project to rescue a tree, as you see here. Um, in addition to planting more trees and encouraging people to report their plantings uh, online, uh, the rescue is about helping people understand the need to remove English ivy and the other plants, the honeysuckle, uh, the, their, their multiple vines uh, that like to take advantage of trees and uh, I know that there's at least one or two more images um, about that. Let's see, here we go. Uh, this is about tree rescuing. And if you've got it in you to uh, get involved, we'd be very interested. There's some adorable uh, videos of uh, Girl Scouts and other young people getting involved, going around their communities and hanging little informational hangers on people's doorknobs that explain the problems that are generated by English ivy. Uh, other groups have been working on this in Arlington, but it's an ongoing educational process to get people's attention. Uh, so again, you can get to this. This is what we're talking about. And this is what more and more of our natural areas are looking like as these exotic vines that have no natural controls, no bio controls uh, upon them. So uh, as of December, uh, we've been able to uh, document uh, that where people had actually removed vines on some, you know, let's call it 6,700 trees. Most of that work has been documented out in uh, Fairfax and Manassas area. Uh, where there's been a lot more involvement in this tree rescuing. Um, so I'm gonna just stop uh, sharing screen here then and 
get us back into conversation mode because I see we're at 1045. That's right. It's perfect timing, Joanne. Very good. good. Very, very informative slides. And your uh, commitment to this cause is terrific. And by the way, it's Earth Day week. So let's That's all right. celebrate the Earth. And um, I live in a condo, but I can participate in Rescue a Tree. I know a, a tree that I might go hang a, a tag on the door and say, you know, you've got vines going up that tree that are not necessary. So let's start with, uh, let's go backwards in these several questions and, and move right along. We've got several. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I would love to plant a native tree in my backyard, but the overhead wires prevent. Well, uh, you're very likely then to be looking at a, a smaller understory tree. And I really didn't share with you um, a walk just because of time constraints. Uh, if people are interested, I, I, I can you know, spend a little time at 11 o'clock and you know, share my screen again and show you more about what's on our website because there's a page on all the, the prominent species, native species of trees there. And, the, how they, and how tall they grow. How tall they grow um, in my own garden uh, where it was appropriate to be looking at, at smaller trees. Uh, we've had the gift because we do have good, um, if you will, uh, borrowed landscape around us with a good many native trees. Um, so the birds have gifted us with three different dogwoods and flowering dogwood, you know, it's our, um, I think it's our state tree, if I'm not mistaken. And um, although there were concerns about it in the 90s because of a, a leaf disease, actually planted in an area that has good air circulation, they do very well. And so dogwoods, and that ties into another question we had. Flowering dogwood is a good one. Uh, another we one is a service question berry. About that, which is, I don't see dogwood on the list of best caterpillar tree. Is the dogwood a good caterpillar tree? So a uh, dogwoods, I would say it's um, more important function in the environment has to do with its fruits. So we didn't go into, I mean, we just, there's a constraint on time here. Um, Another advantage of putting the native shrubbery and trees in that produce fruits is that we happen to be part of a very important migratory flyway. The migration is happening right now. If I were to look up and um, I can do this, they actually can trace how many, approximately how many birds are in transit over Arlington County and Fairfax County and all these different jurisdictions every night. And let's, uh, I usually, when I'm looking at it, pick Fairfax County because it's a wider swath than Arlington. Last time I looked, there were like 60,000 birds transiting. They're going north following insects because they need that protein for their babies. However, in the fall, as they begin to sense the need to move again, and this is an evolutionary pattern established over eons, right? They need to bulk up and put fat on in order to fly to Central and South America. Many of them transit the Gulf of Mexico in one blow. They will lose as much as 40% of their body weight in order to do that, they bulk up on the seed banks and dogwood and spice bush and many of the other native species that we could be planting in our garden offer that kind of sustenance. Very so good. It's and so I want to move different. on to, if I can move on to service berry you mentioned, and we've got that in a local park and I, I see the berries on it. So that good. is- yeah. Not a high riser, it's growing kind of yeah. beneath a canopy of a large tree. Correct. And, that's, is, and service berry would be a good one. How about right. uh, river birch? Well, I would, I would if, if you're limited in terms of height by that, I would look at red buds. Red buds over many years can attain some height, but they, they are relatively fast growing, but they're not weak. Uh, you know, the, the, the Bradford pear tends to fall apart. They claim they've fixed some of those problems in the trade. Again, 
I would stay away from a calorie pear at all costs. I've watched it infiltrate the farm on which my mother grew up in right. the last 10 years. So um, yeah, That's Red Bud, River Other Birch people. can yeah. actually get some height over time. Then I see people succumbing to the, the folks who come knocking on your door who say, yeah, you want me to come in and top those trees, which actually creates other problems. So, yeah, well, very good. So um, there's, uh, we also had a question about, did you give us your website uh, on that last slide? Why or did don't I go yeah. into the chat and I will do two things. I will give you my email address on the assumption you won't all email me so but if you have other questions we don't get to you'll have that and I then love the fact that you are so knowledgeable but you are clearly passionate and uh you i mean love uh, love the stories of the wildlife love the stories of the caterpillars love the stories of the trees and plants and then I'm going to, so everybody see that, Joanne Hutton, Joanne R. Hutton, is that right? That's correct. Yes, the, the Joanne R. Hutton will be a, a little annoyed if you get to her. Yeah. Okay, at gmail.com. Right. And, um, Steve also put this in, which is the website is plantnovanatives.com. Correct. Let's go back to another interesting question here. So let's, mm -hmm. we just talked about the middle level of trees below the big ones. How about the plants from the ground that you could plant specifically under a um, Eastern red cedar? I've tried some shade loving things that died. Okay, that's a very interesting question. Add in, what's your thought about hostas? What's my thought about hostas? What would you like to know about hostas? <laughs> good, bad, indifferent, native, good. They're not native. They're not, not, there is not a hosta that is native. But so, they certainly thrive in shady spaces. They do. They're among the many things that thrive in shady spaces. I would direct everybody, and, and maybe it is worth taking a minute for me to share screen again and go to that uh, Plant Nova Natives website and show you where you can get to the many, many, many species I have a backyard that's very shady and it's just full of plants. Many of them are blooming now. Here's the story. There are groups called spring ephemerals. That means they have a very short lifespan. They come up uh, when there is light. And by the time the trees canopy come out, they have finished their life cycle. That's one reason why spring is so fabulously beautiful around here. And uh, so my backyard right now is probably has 10 or 12 different blooming species. Um, in terms of what works under a Eastern red cedar, I have never read up about the possibility that that particular plant is allelopathic, a term which means that it exudes chemicals through its root system another defensive mechanism that many plants and some trees, the black walnut is the one that is most notorious for um, putting out uh, a chemical that many plants can't tolerate and it reduces competition in the root zone. Uh, competition in the root zone is probably the real reason why someone is having difficulty planting underneath uh, a, a red cedar, that in the dense shade. Most of the fine root hairs that support a tree, contrary to the image we probably grew up with, are in the top six to eight inches of the soil. So you go digging around every year, putting annuals, right, in, in the, the planting area under the canopy of a tree, and you are actually disturbing and uh, making it more difficult for that tree and possibly weakening it. So if you have uh, in your condo associations or your homeowner associations, or even in your own practices, had that you know, desire to plant your pansies underneath your tree, uh, I would be rethinking that practice because it's not sustainable and it's not healthy. Put perennials in there. Uh, put things that can cover the ground. I believe in mulching with plants. Uh, I'm a master gardener. You know, I love plants. I want to have as many different plants in my garden as I can. I also find that if I have 
uh, a good dense cover of plants uh, that it helps with weeding, right? Um, and so I, I think I would do a little bit of Googling uh, about uh, plants that are compatible uh, uh, um, with Eastern red cedar online and see if there's anything out there. I see that question was from Pat Burke. The other resource um, to try and get help if you don't feel competent to do that kind of research is to call the Master Gardener hotline help desk. They call it a help desk and that's available. There's somebody who staffs it every morning, Monday through Friday, nine to 12. If they don't know the answer and quite often they don't, they know how to do the research. They've been trained to try and get answers. You can reach them. Uh, if, you, uh, if you look at their website, I'm gonna put this in the chat box. Um, clarification from Steve that your website is actually not a .com, it's a .org. Oh, no, that's right. Everything available on it is free for you to use in any way. I mean, it's available. That's okay. right. It's not a .com. We are in no way. We have had some grants, but they've all come from um, organizations that were, um, you know, using their money for social responsible investing. And they, they had money to give away like you know, Dominion and um, some of the road building organizations have given us some money for uh, restoration purposes. We work very closely with the Audubon Society of Northern Virginia. They have received grants as well uh, and have been using it to make grants to faith communities, to homeowner associations, and uh, other groups of that sort to do restoration and habitat plantings. And they have a wonderful program called Audubon at Home, <laughs> uh, which is um, called a wildlife sanctuary certification program. Uh, that's something you can look into if you have uh, the interest and the drive to turn your, your property, whatever level of property you have. Uh, I know that, that Fairlington is certified. I know a number of faith organizations that are certified in Arlington. Uh, my property and many other private properties are certified through this Audubon Society of Northern Virginia. The beauty of that program is the invitation it gives you to watch what's going on in your garden and see who uses it. And it changes that uh, thinking of, oh, something's been eating my X plant to, oh, somebody had lunch today right? And it makes you much more attentive to what's happening in your garden. Yeah. So Steve Cordell has, um, has given a live link uh, to you. Yeah, rabbits. I'm sorry, Pat. Rabbits are a painful thing. Uh, they just are. You, you know, the only thing that works. Oh, and there was a question about deer earlier. So I'm going to share what I do about deer in my garden. But I also have a demonstration garden at Potomac Overlook Park. If you like to go walking, uh, walk down to the visitor center at Potomac Overlook. And then there's a on your left, uh, an organic vegetable garden that the master gardeners keep to show people uh, how to grow vegetables. And then just after that, a little garden room that through Audubon Society of Northern Virginia has been planted out to show uh, native plants and highlight our, our locally native plants. Started out as a shade garden and we've lost five trees now or the best of our sheets. So we're learning about sunny plants and showing off both sun and shade now. Um, and we have had to cage every native woody plant against the deer. It's a park. The deer were meant to be there and they were there first and they were habituated. They were eating down our azaleas every year. We finally just got the azaleas out of there and are replacing them gradually with the natives that we wanna be able to demonstrate and show people. But uh, you really have to cage a new, um, a new tree. And let me mention that our Eco Action Arlington offers free trees. That money comes from a pot that developers have to pay into when they take good trees down in order to build these mega mansions and other things that they're putting all over Arlington. And that money then is used to try and encourage people to restore and plant you know, trees where they can. 
they are looking. Am I allowed to go over? I hear I hear well, eleven o'clock chiming. I'm uh, actually going to stop the recording now, and people are going to be sort of moving on to sure. what they have to do now. But uh, this is really.